Tropical Storm Dorian becomes a Category 1 hurricane as it makes landfall over Puerto Rico. Argentinians march on the Social Development Ministry condemning the government austerity policies. And British opposition leader Jeremy Corbyn deconstructs the Prime Minister's attempt to circumvent Parliament in pursuit of Brexit. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South. I am Doris Polo. Tropical Storm Dorian has been upgraded to a Category 1 hurricane as it hits Puerto Rico. The Miami-based National Hurricane Center reported that Dorian is still on a trajectory to strike the Atlantic coast of Florida by the weekend. A state of emergency was declared in Puerto Rico and schools have been closed for August 29th. Two years ago, Hurricane Maria devastated the island, leaving close to 3,000 dead. Obviously, our recommendation is for you to listen carefully to instructions. Calmly, activate your emergency plan. Puerto Rico has been through worse situations. I trust in the people of Puerto Rico. We are ready. We are going forward. And we are going to wait and see how this emergency unfolds. And we are going to be better prepared. We are much better prepared, Puerto Ricans, to cater to the needs you may have during this event. To get further insight into the consequences of Hurricane Dorian hitting Puerto Rico, we're joined by journalist Jay Fonseca. Hello, Jay. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Miss Polo. So, Dorian, a Category 1 hurricane, is the first big test for this new government. How has it reacted so far in terms of preparation? Well, basically, I mean, now we have, I mean, we're waiting uh, for the effects. Remember that Puerto Rico is not just an island, we do have a couple of islands to the right of us, I mean, to the east of us, which are Vieques and Culebra. Those are municipalities of Puerto Rico. Those are the ones that are going to be more affected um, by the hurricane um, right now. So we're waiting on what's going to happen uh, with those islands. We are waiting, and right now it seems that the main island, Puerto Rico, is not going to be affected as much as we were expecting yesterday um, because it seems that hurricane is moving more to the east, northeast more than what it was expected before. It was only in 2017 that Hurricane Maria ravaged Puerto Rico as a Category 4 storm, leaving residents without electricity for 10 months, killing at least 3,000, as well as food and water shortages. And even now, many are still reeling from those effects. Has the government taken any decisive action when compared to 2017? Well, I mean, now we are, of course, it, this is a Cat 1 hurricane. It's not... Uh, Cat 5 hurricane, which was Maria, you're, you're correct. I mean, Maria just devastated Puerto Rico. You cannot uh, even start. I mean, this, this, this hurricane is nine times um, less powerful than uh, Maria. So, of course, uh, the preparations were better, I believe. Um, but, you know, you never know because this is a Cat 1. It's not the same thing. We're not expecting the same results. So, uh, what actually is, is our main problem is the shortage as you said of electricity that was the main problem with maria and it will be this the main problem right now up to now it's the system is holding up i mean our, our electricity is holding up for now so we just we haven't i mean the the, the hurricane has not passed um so we're waiting for it i mean we're waiting on what this it's, the damage is going to cause us so we're just expecting right now uh, i think in a couple of hours we'll really know especially for Vieques and Culebra, those islands are going to be hit pretty hard. Now, with Puerto Rico being a U.S. territory, President Trump has previously stalled disaster relief. Now, earlier today, he tweeted that the state is one of the most corrupt places on earth, adding that millions were given to help with Puerto Rico's recovery, but nothing happened. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, of course, we have politicians that are crooked, like in everywhere in the world. Um, so, I mean, just President Trump saying that because we're, we have corrupt politicians, we don't deserve the aid. That's just, <laughs> that's just so messed up because that will mean that, uh, I mean, then people in Louisiana had uh, corruption problems. And that doesn't mean that Katina people, affected people were not 
he long I mean didn't didn't deserve the help and the aid. I mean in Florida we have had people that were arrested because they were politicians and corrupt. That doesn't mean that he will not help um, Florida. I mean he just does this because he wants to take away FEMA funding from Puerto Rico and put it in the wall with Mexico. That's what he wants. And he's basically um, making it known to his people that he is rather uh, going to take the money from Puerto Rico and put it in the wall than any other thing. I mean, he's preaching to his choir in Kentucky and, and you know, his choir in Oklahoma and Texas. That's what, in my opinion, that's what he's doing. As you mentioned, FEMA, again via Twitter, Trump said the federal emergency agency, management agency, FEMA, was prepared for the storm and he was certain they would do a good job. He also attacked the mayor of San Juan, whom he labeled incompetent. Why do you think the president has taken this position? I mean, he, he just, he, he hates um, Carmen Julin. Carmen Julin uh, Cruz Soto, who is the mayor of San Juan, the capital of Puerto Rico. She's a Democrat. She's part of the uh, Bernie Sanders movement. She's one of the head of, the, of his campaign. So, he, you know, he's, trying, he's attacking uh, an, uh, an opponent, a political opponent. That's basically what he's doing. He's not doing anything else. He's just playing politics with lives. And that's, that's shameful, of course. I mean, we do need help. I mean, we're, we have 23,000 people still living under tarps, under roofs. They don't have, uh, they haven't reconstructed. Uh, their houses and we're expecting the fema funding for that i mean and, and he's always saying provided 93 billion dollars to puerto rico well i mean not even close to that um and basically uh, the uh, i mean congress approved 42.5 billion obligated are just 27 and here that have that have arrived in puerto rico not even 13 billion dollars i mean and that includes the electricity so housing is still a problem i mean yeah congress approved Twenty billion dollars, but that money has not been yet spent here. It's not, not been invested here. And what is the atmosphere like at this point in time in Puerto Rico, with many bracing for a Hurricane Dorian's impact? Well, it it it, it remains to be seen because uh, again, the hurricane which was supposed to pass through the left or to the west side of the island now is is going through uh, basically the east side of Puerto Rico. And especially Vieques and Culebra, those islands too, uh, I mean, and U.S. Virgin Islands are the ones that are going to be affected the most. So we, we haven't uh, lived actually uh, the consequences and, uh, you know, what, 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 I mean, we have, we have electricity. So for now, um, the main thing that really harmed us last time, it's working, it's holding up. So we are waiting until what happens in the next couple of hours. Well, thank you so much, Jay, for joining us and providing an update on what is taking place in Puerto Rico at this time. Staying with uh, the hurricane, Dorian is also affecting the British Virgin Islands, where a storm warning remains in effect. Now, rain has already started affecting the islands, and in a couple hours, the scent of the hurricane will pass about 60 miles south of the territory. Three airports, the August George International, Teddy Bay, and the Terence B. Letsum, have all been closed, and so have all government offices. The government has asked everyone to stay off the streets. Meanwhile, the U.S. Virgin Islands are also bracing for Dorian's effects as the weather system is expected to drift near St. Croix. Our correspondent Daisy Toussaint reports on the storm's trajectory and how the Caribbean is preparing for its potential impact. Dorian is expected to hit Leeway Islands early Wednesday afternoon, first moving from the British Virgin Islands and then to Puerto Rico, bringing with it heavy rains. Dorian has now changed its trajectory and it will now bear down directly on Puerto Rico with maximum sustained winds of up to 50 miles per hour. After making landfall in Puerto Rico this Wednesday afternoon, forecasters now expect tropical storm Dorian to develop hurricane strength. Close to 400 shelters would be open across the island as authorities remain on alert, while they also make preparations for refugees. Puerto Rico's governor has said the government is more prepared now than it was two years ago when Hurricane Maria devastated the island. Meanwhile, over in Dominican Republic, Dorian is expected to hit the eastern area and the country's borders towards the north. An emergency plan is in place after calls made by the country's president, Danilo Mendina, the emergency operations center maintains a yellow and green alert along coastal areas. 
that was Daisy Toussaint with that report. Moving on to the Amazon, Bolivia's president has decreed an ecological pause in the areas affected by wildfires that have devastated over 700,000 hectares in the Bolivian rainforest. This means that all land sales in the region are prohibited for the time being to avoid anyone from taking advantage of the tragedy. Official reports have revealed a drastic decrease in hotspots and wildfires in Bolivia's eastern region known as the Chiquitania. Out of 8,000 fires, the number has come down to just over 1,000. We saw an increase of hot spots on Sunday, but thanks to thousands of firefighters we have deployed, on top of 200 vehicles and 12 firefighting aircrafts, we have greatly reduced the amount of hot spots. President Evo Morales visited the affected regions, and after flying over them, he has confirmed there are fewer fires burning. Nonetheless, he also expressed great concern for the damage caused. So far, I have not seen any more fires, but it's painful to see so many things burn, so much charred land. We stopped our fires from spreading to Paraguay and Brazil. We then moved to Concepcion, where some fires are still burning. But thankfully, communities have not been affected. I ask from authorities to take care of the land and to stop any more fires from appearing. The Bolivian government has also announced that three more firefighting helicopters will join the other seven aircraft currently battling places. At least that includes a 747 super tanker that can carry 75,000 liters of water. The president also decreed an ecological pause in the affected areas. This decree will prevent any sale of land, any new settlement, and will also promote post-fire efforts. This will be a temporary decree that I feel will help greatly. Official reports have shown that 700 hectares were affected just in the Santa Cruz department, but despite the size of these fires, no lives have been lost. And despite significant advances made by other countries, wildfires in Brazil are still devastating the Amazon region. Many social organizations are accusing Brazil's far-right president Jair Bolsonaro of deliberately dragging his feet in taking decisive action. Meanwhile, Congress is moving to approve a project that would cut protected indigenous lands by half. Our correspondent, Brian Mir, is in the city of Puerto Velho in the Brazilian Amazon with the latest. Now it's begun to rain a little bit in Porto Velho, here in the heart of the Amazon region, and it looks like many of the fires have, been, have gone out. As you can see behind me, it's not as smoky as it was yesterday, for example. You can actually see the sky here for the first time since I arrived on Sunday. So as the fires begin to go out, temporarily of course, a lot of journalists are packing up and going home and acting like this is the end of the problem, but the fires are just a symptom of a much greater problem at stake right now. Last night, uh, in, the, in Congress, the Congressional Justice Committee gave the green light to a new project submitted by Bolsonaro's allies for a constitutional amendment which will cut the amount of protected Amazon rainforest inside of indigenous reservations by 50 percent. 50 percent of the indigenous reservations, if this bill is passed, if this amendment is passed, will be open for loggers, cattle ranchers, soy farmers, and miners. Now the problem is that 23% of the remaining virgin Amazon rainforest is located in indigenous reserves. They're huge. And so this essentially would mean, if it was ratified, that 11.5% of the standing Amazon jungle would be destroyed quickly. Now, scientists say if 20% of the remaining Amazon is destroyed, it won't be able to generate its own climate anymore. It will naturally dry out. It will reach this kind of tipping point, which they call dieback, and it will just burn to the ground on its own. And this would be disastrous for the world. That was Brian Mayer with that report. Still to come, Uruguay prepares for upcoming elections. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. Social movements are marching under the slogan, urgent need to combat hunger in Argentina. Demonstrators are condemning the austerity policies of the current president, Mauricio Macri. They are calling for government support for social food programs and basic welfare, which have seen massive cuts over the past four years of his neoliberal administration. 
Our correspondent in Buenos Aires, Ergardo Esteban, has the details. Across the country, social movements are protesting, with the epicenter here in the capital facing the Ministry of Social Development. The protesters are demanding that the government of Mauricio Macri take immediate measures, including an emergency food law, to provide a remedy to the current situation. They are also demanding answers for the most vulnerable in society, who are enduring a difficult situation as the economic crisis here deepens, especially following the open and obligatory PASO primary election last August 11th. The economy has become impossible for Macri's government to manage, and it's affecting the most vulnerable most of all. The demonstrators are hoping to visibilize the crisis by protesting at the Social Development Ministry. It's important to remember that one in every two children in Argentina lives below the poverty line, and often the situation appears hopeless. Moving to neighboring Uruguay, general elections are set for October 27th. The choice between continuing with the current government's plan or going for change is in citizens' hands. There's less than two months to go before elections are held in Uruguay. After three presidential terms under the left-wing Frente Amplio party, voters are now debating whether to support the progressive government's plan or to back a neoliberal change for the ruling party's candidate, Daniel Martinez, if the right wing were to win, all progress made until this point would be compromised. The question is, are we willing to lose the rights we've gained? Do we want to lose marriage equality? Do we want domestic workers to lose their labour rights? Do we want rural workers to no longer be paid extra hours? Do we want women to once again have clandestine abortions? No, what we want is to continue working for a nation that protects the rights of everyone. Meanwhile, opposition candidate Louis Lacaye Pouho, who is representing the National Party, says the progressive model has run its course and a new president needs to step up. I think Uruguay needs to alternate between ruling parties. I think this is healthy for democracy. I am convinced that the Frente Amplio's political project has not only run out of steam, but has completely failed. The ruling party wants to continue down the economic road started 15 years ago which has proven successful in many different ways. On the other hand, the opposition wants to liberalize the economy, reducing fiscal deficit and controlling public spending. It's a formula that has historically increased poverty. Without a doubt, we are seeing two opposing models face off. Before the Frente Amplio rose to power, Uruguay had highs and lows. In the best moments, we saw the GDP grow, but also widespread income inequality and high unemployment. But during the rule of the Frente Amplio, the GDP also grew, but unemployment and income rose as well. The general elections will take place on October 27th, the same day as in Argentina. If no presidential candidate gains a clear majority of votes, a runoff will be held on the last Sunday of November between the two leading candidates. We move on to Colombia, where hundreds of teachers have marched on the Ministry of Education, demanding that the needs of the public education sector in the country are met. The Colombian Education Workers' Federation has called a 48-hour strike until its demands are met. They are calling for the government to respect the right to public education, health and life. In 2018, eight teachers were murdered in the province of Cauca. This year, at least one educator has been assassinated and six there have been threatened because of the role they play as social leaders. Still to come, intelligence service personnel go on trial in Sudan. Don't touch that remote. Welcome back. It's official. 
The Queen has approved the British Prime Minister's request to suspend the Parliament. It's a move that would hamper efforts to block a no-deal Brexit. As a result, the Parliament will now be prorogued in the week beginning September 9th until October 14th. What this means is that MPs would unlikely have enough time to pass any laws that could stop the Prime Minister taking the UK out of the European Union without a deal on October 31st. Political opponents say the controversial move is Johnson's latest power play to strong arm Brexit and his request could face legal challenges and there's also a chance of a vote of no confidence that could bring down the government. Too late. The opposition leader Jeremy Corbyn calls the Prime Minister's move a smash and grab on democracy. This is shutting down Parliament early to prevent a debate. Boris Johnson knows that perfectly well. What he's doing is suspending Parliament after a few days sitting break for the conference and then dissolve Parliament altogether and come back with a uh, Queen's speech sometime in October. He is trying to prevent Parliament holding him to account. We will do absolutely everything we can next Tuesday to legislate to prevent him doing that and oppose this government for what it's doing. A Sudanese court has started the trial of security agents accused of causing the death of a teacher who died in custody earlier this year. 41 members of the National Intelligence and Security Services are suspected to have been involved in the death of Ahmed al -Kir. He died in prison after being arrested for organizing protests against former President Omar al-Bashir. His death fueled the demonstrations against Bashir, who was toppled in April after months of mass rallies. We are expecting that the trial will take a record amount of time. And what is helping is the accuracy of the judge and his good management of trial, as well as the seriousness of everyone to reach a resolution and to head towards a fair judgment after condemning the convicts and acquitting the innocents, as the people are looking for the truth and justice. And we finish in Ethiopia, where the 8th Conference on Climate Change and Development in Africa has started in the capital Addis Ababa. It brings together the continent's climate stakeholders who will examine Africa's nationally determined contributions. It will further ensure that Africa comes up with a united position to take to the Climate Action Summit in September. We've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Doris Polo. Thank you for watching.